I want to speak today on the topic, Why Four Gospels? We are all acquainted with the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I find it appropriate to bring this message because right now, especially in our Sabbath school class, we are doing the Book of Mark. And I look to the back of that uh, quarterly and I see we're going to do the Book of John. So it feels all fitting that we should have an idea what these four Gospels are all about. The meaning of gospel is good news. And good news of who? Good news of Jesus Christ. So the four gospels are telling you a narrative about the life of Jesus Christ. But why four gospels? It could have been one gospel that would tell you the narrative of Jesus, his birth, his death, his resurrection, and what he came to do for us here on earth. But God in his wisdom gave four gospels. What God was doing, he was trying to speak to every member of the population, every single member. Matthew wrote the gospel to the Israelites, the religious people. That's their account. If they read the gospel, they will understand what Matthew is talking about. And then Mark, he wrote to the busybody. In those days, there were the Roman soldiers. They say he wrote to the Roman soldiers. Because they were busybody, quick, fast, brief. It's the shortest gospel, 16 chapters, but it's right on the ball. Then Luke. Luke now is talking to the, the Greek. Those were the scholars of the day, the geniuses. And Luke was speaking to the minds and the heart of the Greek. Who? were Gentiles. And John, John wrote to the church. He wrote to the believer. He wrote to us. So I'm going to go into the gospel just brief, briefly so that we can get a little understanding of what the gospels are all about. First, let me try and bridge the gap between the old and the new. The Old Testament finished with the book of Malachi. And we are told that for 400 years, it was silent from heaven. Nobody heard a word. God stopped communicating. And as our scriptures read this morning, at that time, he was speaking through the prophets. Malachi was one of the last prophets. Malachi ended with some charges that he left against the church. And then after those charges for 400 years, I repeat again, 400 years there was nothing. Then one day, an angel of the Lord, he broke in upon a time of prayer by a priest called Zachariah. He was standing 
at the altar in the temple in Jerusalem. And the angel came to him and told him, you're going to have a son. Zachariah and his wife had no children. This son was going to be the guy who was going to bring the news for the birth of Jesus. It was after the birth of Jesus, God started through these four men writing again. When the Old Testament was closed, there were the Medes and the Persians, if you remember, and the Egyptians, they were ruling at the time. But now we start reading in the New Testament, there was a new power. That power was Rome. Rome was now in charge. The whole condition of the Judea system had changed. We have never heard about the scribes and Pharisees. We are now reading about the scribes and Pharisees. In the Old Testament, there was no scribes and Pharisees. So this is the radical change that had happened. The Jews, they were no longer making idols, but they were having a different type of idolatry. They were holding on to legal holiness, they called it. The, no, the law now became the idol to them. There were the scribes, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, just to name a couple of the bunch of people that were in the church in those days. And we all know the Pharisees was a group were quite religious, very legalistic. The Sadducees were the warm, more wealthier bunch. Their doctrines was not really spiritual. And they said their philosophy was to eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow you shall die. The scribes, on the other hand, was a professional group of expounders of the law. They were concerned more of the letter rather than the law itself. There was danger, and there is still today, in wanting information and knowledge, but failing to make it a part of our lives. The scribes, through studies, were able to learn the facts of the scripture and all the truth contained in it, but never allowed it to take possession of their hearts. Matthew in writing in his gospel say, I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no case enter the kingdom of heaven. So it, t it tells you plainly that the type of righteousness the, the, the scribes and Pharisees had, it did not meet. It did not meet. So, as we know, the, the stage was now set for the coming of the Christ. John the Baptist was born, he grew up, and he went in the wilderness, and he preached from the wilderness, and Jesus came. He lived in this world, he died, and he went back to heaven. It is now that God begins writing again. 
So he called in Matthew, and he said, Matthew, I want you to write the first gospel to my people. You have to let them know of the good news. You see, this gospel of Matthew was written by someone who was a revenue collector for the Romans. Jesus had to call him out from where he was and said to him, come, follow me. Matthew got up, left everything, and began to follow Jesus. Matthew was a follower of Jesus. He was a disciple. As we have discussed, it is written to the Jews. It gathers a lot of Old Testament prophecies than any other gospel. It connects the old to the new. You may say, yes, that has to be, because the new has to connect to the old. But if we read Matthew, it takes you a little more deeper. It's the only gospel where the church is mentioned. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, it says, And I say unto you, Thou art Peter upon this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The Gospel of Matthew presents the program of God, which is the kingdom of heaven. This expression occurs 32 times in the Gospel of Matthew. We have to understand that the Jews were always looking for the Messiah, that king that is going to come to reign and to rule with, with them on the earth. So that's why when Matthew finishes this gospel, you're not seeing a Christ ascending into heaven. What you're seeing is a king on here on earth, the kingdom of God, because this is what the Jews were looking for. The kingdom of the Lord will be ruled by Jesus. He was born a king, died a king, rose a king, and will come again a king. And Matthew, through his inspiration of the Holy Ghost, taking the Jews through the progressive movement leading to the kingdom establishment, he had to begin his gospels with genealogy. That's why Matthew started with all the genealogies coming right down to Jesus' birth. Matthew had to prove that Jesus was the king through David's line. So remember that the Jews were here looking for that king. So that's why in this gospel, it, Christ is the Messiah, the king, the king ruling in the kingdom of heaven. This is a small synopsis of what Matthew is all about. Is concerned with the Jews and to make sure that they understand that that king that they were looking for is here. The kingdom of God is at hand. The king is Jesus Christ. Mark, on the other hand, was more or less actually speaking to the busybody on the street. Mark was not actually an apostle or a disciple of Christ. Matthew was, and so too was John. But Luke and Mark were close associates of the apostle Paul. Mark's full name is John Mark, referring to the time when Peter was released from prison. This is the first time his name was mentioned his mother, we believe, was a wealthy and prominent Christian in the Jerusalem church, and eventually the church met at her home. 
Mark accompanied Paul in his first missionary journey and was the nephew of Barnabas. Eventually, we have read that he was called a son by Peter. In 1 Peter 5.13, he said, My son Mark, send greetings to you. Some scholars even believe that Mark was writing this gospel for Peter. Because they were so close together that they think that this gospel Mark was writing is Peter's gospel. But it has not been proven. And this same John Mark is the, main, is the reason why the split became between Paul and Barnabas. This is the same guy. As mentioned before, Mark Gospel was written for the Romans who ruled with a strong arm and represented action, human power. To flee from this power was impossible and to resist it was fatal. The Romans were strong. It was in that day God spoke through Mark to that segment of the population. It is a gospel of action. Jesus laid aside his robe in this gospel. And he put on, girded on the towel of service. In Matthew, he was a king. In Mark, he is a servant. He is a worker. Mark expressed in chapter 10, verse 45, for even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give life a ransom for many. He is presented as the servant of Jehovah, a fulfillment of Isaiah 42, verse 1 and 2. The style of Mark is brief and blunt, pertinent and short, very simple. Few gospel testament scripts are quoted, and most of the Jewish customs are explained, which gives additional proof that it was written for a foreigner. Matthew gave us genealogy because a king must have genealogy, but Mark does not because a servant does not need genealogy. A servant needs references. He needs to get the job done. And this is the gospel of action, the servant of God, the wonder worker. That's the gospel of Mark. Now let's look at Luke. Luke was referred to as the beloved physician in Colossians 4.14. He was obviously of a very high intellectual level, as well as spiritual. This explains partially why he traveled along with Paul, who also had a very high intellect. There is reason to believe that he was a Gentile, convert of Paul who stuck with him to the end. When Paul was writing to Timothy, he said, only Luke is with me, 2 Timothy 4.11. Of the four gospel, gospels, Luke had the most complete history. He presents the, persons of Jesus, the person of Jesus as perfect, and divine, a savior of the world. Luke wrote to his countrymen dressed as Matthew did. He wrote, he wrote to the minds of the Greek. The Greeks at that time displayed the most brilliant geniuses the world had ever seen. They had developed the finest culture, language, and philosophy. 
Their minds and thinking were striving towards a perfect man outside of God. Although the Greek language to which these Gospels were written, the people themselves had no clue about the spiritual realm. The world became their school, their home, their playground, and their worship workshop. Paul, in speaking to the Greeks, told them that in time past, they were Gentiles, having no hope and without God in this world. Gentiles are all other people who are not Jews, aliens from the worship rites. Gentiles could be referred to as an equivalent to the Greek. Luke presented Jesus as a perfect man, the very person the Greeks were trying to produce. So in Luke, he is the son of man, that perfect man. John, on the other hand, now we are getting into John, the last gospel. It is generally assumed that John's gospel is the easiest to understand. The simplicity of the language had deceived many. Notice how simple these words are in chapter 14, verse 20. Ye in me and I in you. A grade four student can tell you that these words are made up of one conjunction, two preposition, and four pronouns. But what does it mean? I in you and ye in me. I in you is sanctification. And the ye in me is salvation. Jesus in me is my salvation. Sorry. Ye in me, with you is in Jesus, is your salvation. And Jesus in you is your sanctification. Simple words, but very, very deep meaning. This was the last gospel that was written. Most of the other disciples were now dead, and John was alone. John was then called to write to the church, which has already had three gospels. God wanted something more spiritual and something more deep, something that will enable the church to grow. In this gospel, John does not take you to Bethlehem, he takes you down a silent corridor of time through vast emptiness of space to the beginning that was not a beginning. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. You can go as far back as you like in your mind. Even the Greek would not understand this with all their brains and philosophy. But God was not writing to the Greeks. He was writing to the believer. A person who have come to the knowledge of God and have faith in him does not need to be told about the virgin birth anymore. He already believes that. <laughs> Jesus takes his own into the upper room. That's in Mark, it's in, that's in John. He takes his own to the upper room and reveals to them things that would enable them to grow. No other gospel does that. John also places an emphasis on the risen Christ and his deity, but the human side of him has not lost. Do you notice it is only John who tells about the trip to Samaria and that he sat down at the well and was weary 
Can you think of anything more human? Oh yes, we could think about one more. Don't forget that he wept. John, like Matthew, was a disciple of Christ and perhaps the youngest. He was distinguished as being one of the few disciples that followed Christ to the cross. He was also left the duty to be the son unto Jesus' mother. John used the name Jesus almost entirely. Why did he use Jesus? Because God became flesh in John. Jesus is the Son of God. In these four Gospels, God is reaching every type of people with the good news. There is purpose in everything that God does. Now, these Gospels that he had given, that you should go into the world and spread this good news. This is the good news, the Gospel of Jesus Christ. Every kindred and tongue cannot say they do not understand what's this good news. If you are a busybody, if you are a Christian, if you are an intellect, if you are a Jew, everybody got a pinch of the knowledge of Jesus Christ. So the whole problem of us saying we do not know will not ever be accepted. When God comes back for us, we can never say we were not told. Read the Gospels, spread the good news, go out into the world. Jesus Christ died and rose again for our salvation, that we may be with him when he returns for us, which is not too long. The problem that we have is that we refuse to accept the word of God. We do our own thing, be lackadaisical about everything, not being serious about the word of God. God give us the Bible that we will be trained up and know him in the power of his resurrection and in the fellowship of his suffering. God wants us to know him because he loves us with an everlasting love. We cannot say heaven have not spoken. It is for us to take the word of the Lord, to use it, and to glorify him who is in heaven. I would close with one bit of information that I want you to listen very carefully to. I have taken this from Ellen, Ellen's White's writing, The Great Controversy. It is a chapter in the Herald of the Morning. The last two paragraphs. And listen. The watchmen upon the walls of the Zion should have been the first to catch the tidings of the Savior's advent the first to lift their voices to proclaim him near, the first to warn the people to prepare for his coming, the watchman. We are the watchman. But 
They were at ease, dreaming of peace and safety, while the people were asleep in their sins. Jesus saw his church like a barren fig tree covered with pretentious leaves, yet destitute to precious fruit. There was a boastful observance in the forms of religion, while the spirit of true humility, patience, and faith, which alone should render the service acceptable to God, was lacking. Instead of grace, of the spirit, there, there, there were manifested pride, a formalism, vain glory, selfishness, and oppression. A backsliding church closed their eyes to the signs of time. But God did not forsake them, nor suffered his faithfulness to fail. But you know what? We departed from him and separated ourselves from his love. So as we refused to comply with the condition, his promises were not fulfilled. Such is the sure result of neglect to appreciate and improve the light and privileges which God bestows. Unless the church is full, sorry, unless the church will follow on his opening providence, accepting every ray of light, performing every duty which may be revealed, religion will inevitably degenerate into the observance of forms and the spirit of vital godliness will disappear. The truth has been repeatedly illustrated in the history of the church. God requires of his people work of faith and obedience corresponding to the blessings and privileges bestowed. Obedience is required as sacrifice and involves a cross. And this is why so many of the professed followers of Christ refuse to receive the light from heaven. And like the Jews of old, knew not the time of their visitation. Because of their pride and unbelief, the Lord passed them by and revealed his truth to those who, like the shepherds in Bethlehem and the Eastern Magi's, had given heed, heed to all the light they had received. This is a serious warning for the church. If we will not hinder the call that God is calling us to do, and don't make the observances that are necessary we will be left behind. Church, we do not want to be forsaked. Let us strive to do the things that God wants us to do. He calls us out of darkness into his marvelous light. And this is not to be taken lightly. Jesus is coming again very, very soon. And if we are not ready, we will be left behind. So let us make our election sure. Let us make everything that we have to do be right in the sight of God. Let us be ready for his coming, and he is coming soon. Amen.